Howdy. So we're going to step away from education for a little bit, and we're going to talk about international development. Um, and hopefully, at the end of this, I might inspire some of you to be starting some new businesses to help with international development. I want to start with the slide that's up there right now that shows infectious disease mortality in the United States in the 20th century, because this slide gives me lots of hope about international development. There are very interesting things that you can notice about this slide. One is that it goes down significantly in the first half of the 20th century, excepting a spike for the 1918 influenza pandemic. And it goes down before the two major advances that medicine uh, quantifies as being the most important in the 20th century, antibiotics and vaccines. So what caused this decline in mortality in the US in the early part of the 20th century? Well, the authors of the paper that this graph comes from, Armstrong, Kahn, and Pinner, discovered that this was a result directly of infrastructure improvements. Clean water, sanitation, better housing, better cook fuels, all of these things reduced deaths in the United States from infectious disease. And all of these things ended up contributing to a better quality of life. What I believe is that what was true for the United States in the first half of the 20th century is true for people living on $2 a day today. And I don't just believe this because of some graph. I believe this because I've seen it. I've seen the power of infrastructure improvements in villages. This is a photo that I took on a pig farm in Cuba um, about a decade ago. Now, this pig farm was not your ordinary pig farm. It was clean, it had clean water, it had shade trees, it had clean cook fuels that used gas for lamps, gas for cooking. Another pig farm that I visited was the exact opposite. It had contaminated water from the pigs. It had inefficient three stone fires that chopped down all the shade trees and produced uh, indoor air pollution in the kitchen. Okay, totally different quality of life between these two pig farms. So what contributed to this difference? It was a single technology, a biodigester, that took the pig waste and turned it into methane for cooking and fertilizer for crops. It's this technological improvement that I think needs to get into villages. But the question is, where is the biodigester store? Where is the store that's providing the clean cook stoves? So how do we get these goods out to people? I started an NGO called the AIDG to try and find new technologies uh, that could be gotten out to villages at low cost. Uh, so we did hydroelectric load controllers, biodigesters, biosand filters, Pelton turbines, a range of technologies. And we found that we were able to produce these things far cheaper than regular market rates by producing them locally. There is a big gap in the market, and it's a gap that's represented by this stove. This is the first stove that was produced by Siemens to enter the emerging market. It's the only stove produced by a Fortune 500 company for people making a few dollars a day. You'd think that the market would be flooded with products like this, but unfortunately, Fortune 500 companies are not addressing the needs of people who are making a few dollars a day. There are 2.47 billion people making less than $2 a day. It's a giant market that has nobody designing new products for it. And we need people designing new products for it. We need people providing new services for it. Because as CK Prahlad noticed, there is a fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. There is an opportunity to make money and do good. And we need this to eliminate poverty because government alone is not gonna do it. Charity alone is not gonna do it. So we pivoted and we started investing in entrepreneurs, not technologies. We invested in solar streetlights, prefab housing, a range of technologies. Um, and we learned that these technologies don't have to be new. This is a stove from a Haitian stove provider called d and &E Green Enterprises. They went to Ghana 
and copied a stove design that had succeeded in Ghana with toil and energy, brought it to Haiti, and because they copied the design, they're able to jump into production, and they produced 30,000 units in the first year. This year, they're tooling up to produce 300,000 units a year. Another example is from Guatemala, from a company that we support called Kitsol. Kitsol saw a market for solar lanterns in Guatemala and solar systems, and they realized they couldn't produce them in Guatemala cheap enough to be affordable to people. So they went to China, and they started production in China, imported it to Guatemala, and got the solar systems cost competitive with candles. So people could pay what they're paying now and afford a better experience with better light, better energy. This is not to say that all the products need to be old existing products. Uh, some of the products can be new. This is an example of a company uh, that came out of the Design for Extreme Affordability class at Stanford. This was their first prototype for an incubator for an infant. Keeps the infant warm if they're premature or they're underweight. They're able to take that into production uh, in massive scale because they did their research and development in an NGO and licensed the technology from the NGO to a for-profit business that could get venture capital and take things to scale. So how did these companies get venture capital? Where are these funders? Well, traditionally, the funding came from charity. Um, people viewed businesses for the poor the same way they viewed charities for the poor. And that charitable giving is not going away. This is US charitable giving uh, historically since 1970. And as you can see, people who are wealthy in the US are still giving to causes um, in great numbers. But 10 years ago, a woman named Jacqueline Novogratz decided that she'd take that charity and turn it on its head and start investing with it to create new businesses. Over the course of 10 years, she invested $73 million, and that money ended up impacting 86 million people worldwide. Social investment, impact investment, since that period has gotten hot. It is now a $10 billion uh, industry in the US. There was $10 billion in 2012 invested in social impact businesses. Just compare that to traditional venture capital, which is well known in the US. That invested 27 billion in 2012. So social impact investing is catching up with venture capital. It reminds me of the growth of another financial instrument for the poor, microfinance. This is the growth of Grameen Bank to 2009. Grameen Bank over 30 years expanded massively. But something happened in 2009. Microfinance started collapsing in India. And the reason why was because they accepted too much money too fast. And they started investing in people who couldn't afford to repay the loans. In India, this led to an epidemic of suicides. So people who couldn't afford to repay the loans ended up deciding to kill themselves. This led to political pressure which scaled back the microfinance industry. Do I think something similar is gonna to happen to the impact investing industry? I actually am concerned because the impact investing industry is very opaque. For that 10 billion, you really don't know who is investing in whom and where the money is going. For the traditional VC industry, that information is readily available to entrepreneurs. So unless that information becomes available to entrepreneurs, investors can't find the right entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs can't find the right investors. So you have investments that are made in the wrong types of companies to scale, and you don't have good exits. So it is concerning to me where impact investing is going. So where will entrepreneurs get their money? Well, the entrepreneurs that I know are going to crowdfunding. And this guy right here, Perry Chen, started one of the largest crowdfunding sites, Kickstarter. A few years ago, Kickstarter's largest uh, crowdfunding uh, uh, project was a few thousand dollars. Uh, I got a watch from a company that crowdfunded in Kickstarter uh, called Pebble, 
And they raised over $10 million a bit over a year ago. Okay, so there's been a tremendous growth in crowdfunding. And in the US, the laws are changing so that the crowd is not just patronizing you, is not just pre-buying a product, but the crowd can now invest in people directly. And this is gonna fundamentally change how new products get out to the poor. An example of this is the brick. The brick was developed by Ushihidi, which is an African company that does information technology. It's a modem that's wireless that has a backup battery so you never lose connection to the internet no matter where you are. Um, the brick is something that they wanted for the African market, but they didn't have the money to take it to production. So they started selling it to people globally, and people all over the world wanted the brick. They got the product, and they did the Kickstarter, and they were able to raise several hundred thousand dollars, took the product into production, and soon they're gonna have it available in the African market. As you can see, crowdfunding is just starting, but I think it is the way of the future for entrepreneurs to get their funding. So what are the market opportunities that these entrepreneurs can address? What are the problems that are facing the poor? Well, a significant one is fuel, okay? Energy sources of all types are extremely important for people who are poor who pay up to 40% of their income on energy costs. Uh, cooking fuel especially is a significant problem. Clean water, water for agriculture, um, is another major problem. Sanitation is a significant problem. If you could take that porcelain toilet and design an equivalent toilet for $10, you would make billions, okay? Because right now, people are stuck using open-air defecation and flying toilets in many shanty situations across the world. When you think about these problems, it's important to think big. A good example of thinking big is Grameen Phone. In the 90s, Grameen Phone made a decision that they would go after the cell phone market for the poor. And they started providing cell phones to people who previously were believed never uh, capable of affording a phone. They demonstrated a multi-billion dollar market opportunity that was copied in developing countries all over the world by different providers and received billions of dollars of investment and created the modern day prepaid telecommunications industry. This was a small pro-poor business that thought big and was able to demonstrate scale and ended up being replicated to provide services to billions of people. Another area to think about is bundling services. Uh, right now, we are trying to sell products to the poor. Uh, we think that it's very important for people who are in developing countries to get high efficiency stoves. So our initial reaction is to sell the stove directly to the person. I don't know about you, but I don't personally own the stove in my house. I rent the stove as part of my monthly rent as part of the leasing of the facility that I'm in. I think that similar leasing agreements, similar bundling of services uh, can provide qu high quality of service to people who are making a few dollars a day at very little cost. And that's the important thing. You need to develop goods and services that people can afford. If you can do that, you can scale tremendously and if you're making a profit, just a few dollars, uh, you can scale that profit to reach new populations. It's very important that we think about designing new products and new services for the poor. And I hope that today I've inspired you to consider opportunities that you hadn't considered before. Thank you very much.